Great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining earlier today. Um, we, we're starting at 7, 7, 7.30 because it's a busy week with Europe ECR and many commitments. So we appreciate you joining us earlier. And it's an extreme pleasure to have Philip Lutz, who's a good friend from Leipzig. And we've worked on a couple of projects together on Tricuspid, but, but he's really become to me a thought leader on how you treat mitral and tricuspid uh, with transcatheter options and particularly in understanding the pathophysiology behind um, the disease and what we do. So Philip, we're really looking forward to your, th to your talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Asim, for your kind intro introduction and for the invite. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to be part of this um, um, series which, which you and your team put together. I, I, I love it and I tune in almost every week. So really an honor to be part of that. And um, this talk follows on a little bit to what um, you've heard last week, what was presented by Stefan von Badeleben. He presented the latest um, developments in the field of transcatheter tricuspid valve um, interventions. And I will focus today more on the implications of that procedure, both on cardiac performance, but also on extracardiac alterations, which are commonly associated with tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure. Why could that be of interest to look at biomedical physiology and systemic implications? Well, the, the hope is that this would improve or in, in, has the potential to enhance our understanding of the disease. Um, the field is developing extremely fast, but it's been only for, for a couple of months and years that we focus more on tricuspid, on the tricuspid valve. It's, it's been the forgotten valve for, for the longest time and we still have to improve our understanding of the disease. It might help to identify new, new approaches to charge procedures and success beyond just reporting the change in tricuspid regurgitation, but actually understanding what it means for cardiac and, and non-cardiac alterations. And ideally that should help to improve clinical selection. All of that should be beneficial for treating tricuspid regurgitation, but beyond of that, maybe the, 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 the biggest advantage of trying to understand right heart physiology and right heart failure a little bit better is the chance to, to understand right heart failure as an entity which is a, a, a tremendous clinical challenge, challenge a little bit better because, and I think everyone would agree, that's something we hardly understand at all. The fact that, tricuspid, that the tricuspid valve is sort of doomed to become, in, become incompetent during patient's life is something which is for a very long time. Um, it's been reported more than 150 years ago by Thomas Wilkinson King. The tri tri tricuspid valve is fragile. It's a very delicate structure. And unfortunately, it is supported only by one solid structure, and that's the uh, interventricular septum. The RV free wall tends to dilate very easily and thereby pulling apart the, the leaflets of the tricuspid valve, causing a uh, cooptation gap as shown here. It's called a tricuspid valve, although the anatomical variations are almost in, in, in indefinite. And as you can see here, what's, what's seen actually more commonly, if you look for it, that's a small additional leaflet um, in one of the commissures. Now that paper is from a seams group, really demonstrating the extreme rapid development in the field transcatheter therapies from zero to here in 2016 to uh, 17, just one report, and then see what um, two years ago was already um, under investigation. And um, this is even more today. The motivation for that is obvious. Tricuspid regurg is extremely common and surgical results are not as good as we would like them to be. At the moment, the most commonly applied technology is edge-to-edge -edge repair, either with a triclip or with a Pascal device. We know now from the trilumen trial results that edge-to-edge -edge repair to treat tricuspid regurgitation is safe and is effective. And at least when considering one-year data is quite durable with 87% um, of patients still at one year having at least one degree of TR reduction. And that relates into clinical benefits with a reduction in 
rate of um, hospitalizations after the treatment as compared to the time period before, and also an improvement in quality of life. And then the newest kit on the block, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement with the um, Evoke device. This device receives a lot of attention and um, also creates a lot of enthusiasm and, and rightly so. Um, um, it was just presented um, two days ago at ACC, the um, great outcome of um, almost 60 patients demonstrating that with that technology, TR is not reduced, but is um, almost completely abolished in the vast majority of patients. Pivotal trials comparing these therapies with medical treatment are underway. Um, we do have one solid report on a comparison of tricuspid valve therapies with medical treatment on a propensity score match analysis, demonstrating that treating TR can actually improve survival or suggest that it improves survival and can reduce the number of um, heart failure hospitalizations. But what you can also see is that the number of events during a follow-up of one year is still quite high. And there is, is no doubt that um, some patients might not benefit from that therapy. And the, the, the biggest challenge is to improve the clinical patient selection for these therapies, something we just start to discuss amongst us. Now, what, what we wanted to do with our research is to use transcatheter tricuspid valve therapies as a, as a pathophysiological model to study the acute implications of treating right heart failure in patients with tricuspid regurg, both for cardiac performance, but also on extracardiac alterations with the hope that that would help us to understand the disease better, and then eventually also improve patient selection for these therapies. When it comes to the question of who is benefiting the most and who might not benefit anymore, the, the one signal which came out in, in, in every study um, in different cohorts was the question whether the procedure was actually successful, um, meaning that those who had a, a marked reduction in tricuspid regurg, those are the patients who also benefited um, from a clinical point of view. However, when we only looked at those, um, the, the, the larger bag of the people and, and patients who had a successful intervention, there it was more difficult to define clear parameters and markers which are predictive for clinical benefit. Two questions always came up and still coming up. And this is the question about right ventricular function and pulmonary hypertension. Now, it was quite surprising that when um, it was looked for the, the impact of TAPSI on the outcome after transcatheter uh, therapies for TR, there was actually no signal in there. So at least when using TAPSI, TAPSI does not help to differentiate those patients who benefit from those who might not benefit. Well, the problem with TAPSI is that it looks at RB function, or it, it only looks at longitudinal contraction of the right ventricle. In a healthy right ventricle, as shown on the left, longitudinal contraction is the most relevant, um, um, is the predominant um, mode of contraction of the right ventricle. However, when the RV becomes diseased in chronic right ventricular volume or pressure overload, the contraction pattern of the right ventricle changes a little bit with normally a loss in longitudinal function and sometimes an increase in radial um, co contraction as demonstrated here. Another way to look at RV function and global RV function is using cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, which then allows to dissect the, the, the whole um, right ventricle um, three-dimensionally and thereby calculate volumes and also ejection fraction. And when we did so, we actually found that um, TAPC, again, longitudinal function was not predictive for any outcome. But when we looked at right ventricular ejection fraction derived from MR, you can see that, and this is as expected, those with reduced right ventricular ejection fraction um, in red, those had an inferior outcome as compared to those with preserved ejection fraction. So global function is more important than TAPC. What we also did 
is we used feature tracking. Feature tracking on MR allows you, and um, this mirrors what's been done on ECHO, allows you to, to assess longitudinal, radial, and circumferential strain. And the results of that analysis is, is summarized here. This is a quite busy slide, so I try to guide you through that. What we did is we, we grouped the patients into three types of RV contraction. Type one are those patients who had preserved or normal tapsy and normal right ventricular ejection fraction. And then we had one group, this is type two. These are patients with um, reduced tapsy, but still preserved global RV function, right ventricular ejection fraction. And then type three, those patients had reduced tapsy and reduced right ventricular ejection fraction. What you can see here, this is the, the strain pattern of these patients. So in, in those with good tapsy and good ejection fraction, longitudinal strain was, was, was preserved and radial strain was less. So now what, ha what happens with, um, as soon as the RV starts to, 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 to be um, exposed to, to chronic um, pressure and or volume overload, you see that the longitudinal function goes down. So tapsy goes down. But this, at this intermediate stage, seems to be compensated by an increase in radial strain. And therefore, although patients had a reduction in TAPSI, the global RV function was still preserved. And then only in type three, and I believe that type three comes also in, in the course of the disease after type two, um, this compensation of lack of longitudinal function by radial um, contraction is lost and only then we only we also see a reduction in right ventricular global function and if we then look at the outcome of these three groups you can see that um, only type um, three has an inferior outcome whereas the outcome of type one and type two is is, is comparable meaning that at an early stage tapsy can actually underestimate the global function of the right ventricle. And if you would like to use RV function to, 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 to guide your decision-making about um, clinical benefits of the procedure, then you better should look for uh, parameters of global RV function rather than longitudinal or TAPSI only. Obviously, MR is, 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 a, is a very powerful research tool, but, but not available in all patients and can't be applied in those with RV leads. Um, another possibility is to use 3D echo. Again, does not work in everyone, but our dear friends and colleagues from Munich um, put together that work in, in, I think in 80 patients, they used 3D echo, they looked at global RV function and they um, came up with the exactly same results, with the same cutoff of 45% um, of right ventricular ejection fraction below certainly an inferior outcome as compared to those with preserved RV function. So the next big topic is the question about primary hypertension. Uh, should we exclude those patients from, from, from treatment? Should we keep on excluding them from clinical trials as we do at the moment? Primary hypertension and tricuspid regurg is something which is seen together very, very commonly. We know that primary hypertension in general, important adverse outcomes and in current guidelines, surgical TR interventions are uh, discouraged in patients with primary hypertension. But, and here begins the controversy, we also have um, know from some reports that it seems that primary hypertension, so high PA pressures estimated on echo, seem to be protective with even better and reduced mortality after tricuspid valve surgery. Well, I think these, these uh, controversial results can be explained by looking a little bit more into how primary hypertension is actually assessed. Either you do it by echo or you do it invasively. What you can see here is the correlation between echocardiographic estimation of systolic pressures, PA pressures, and then the invasive PA pressures. And you can see that there's only a very um, mediocre correlation at, at all. It is significant but um, there's a lot of scatter. But what you can also see is that there are some patients, they, they have low PA pressures invasively. We then look at those patients who have high pressures invasively. There's one group, they also have high pressures on echo, but there is another group, despite having high pressures invasively, these patients exhibit low pressures on echo. So echo underestimates PA pressures 
in these patients um, um, quite markedly. And um, this is important for outcome. We called that red group, this is a discordant diagnosis of primary hypertension, whereas blue is a concordant diagnosis of um, hypertension. You can see that um, this actually matters for outcome. Those in, in red with a discordant diagnosis, they have a clearly inferior outcome. It might not be the best candidates for, for treating tricuspid regurgitation by transcatheter means as compared to those in, in blue. They have primary hypertension, but they have a concordant diagnosis. So high PA pressures, both invasively and on echo. And they have a pretty similar outcome as compared to those without primary hypertension. And the reason why echo might underestimate PA pressures is because the coaptation depth is extremely large because there is no pressure separation anymore between RV and RA and because right atrial pressures might be very high. So all of these things are probably associated with inferior outcome. And this explains why a discordant diagnosis um, indicates less favorable outcome after treating TR. The other thing you should look for when evaluating patients before treating TR is the discrimination between pre and post capillary primary hypertension. Because again, this matters in terms of, of outcome. And those with pre-capillary pre primary hypertension have a clearly um, inferior outcome as compared to those with post. And uh, another way to look at it, transpulmonary gradient, highly predictive for outcome in these patients. Now this, again, warrants a bit of explanation because for the right ventricle, it should not matter whether RV pressures are high due to pre-capillary hypertension or um, due to post-capillary hypertension. So to understand that, we have to look a little bit closer to the effects of treating TR on the performance of the right ventricle. Again, we use therefore magnetic resonance imaging. We calculated the volumes, the ejection fraction, and um, of the right ventricle. And we also use flow measurements, which allows us to calculate the, the, the true net effective forward flow into the, into the primary artery. And here are the results. So from a pathophysiological point of view, only considering RB loading conditions, what we do by treating TI is we reduce RB preload, so less tricuspid regurgitation fraction, and we normally would leave RV afterload um, pretty stable with no change in, in RV systolic pressures. So this, the, the, the procedure itself is a, is a preload reduction procedure. As a consequence, the right ventricular volumes and diastolic, they come down as expected. And this is always one month and then it's six months and then no further changes between one and six months. So all what we see is probably purely due to acute changes in loading um, but no changes between one and six months. And systolic volume stay pretty much the same. Now the total right ventricular stroke volume goes down after treating tricuspid regurg. But this is only because the regurgitant volume into the right atrium is, is now um, reduced, whereas the effective stroke volume, so the amount of blood which actually enters the pulmonary artery increases, which, which is a good thing. Now, if we now go back to those patients with pulmonary hypertension, if we increase flow to the pulmonary artery, into the lungs, that might be actually a bad thing to do, given that you have a fixed resistance in the, pulmonary, uh, in the lungs, in, in the pulmonary arteries, because that would imply that RV pressures might go up and that um, right ventricular wall stress and thereby also dysfunction might become even more. In a precapillary primary hypertension patient, the resistance should really be fixed. And an increase in flow to, to the primary artery might be detrimental. Now in postcapillary primary hypertension, this might be slightly different. And um, I'm gonna explain that uh, in a second. When we think about postcapillary primary hypertension in the absence of, of mitral regurg, this is a, is, this is a half path situation normally. So we have increased left atrial and left ventricular stiffness, we have uh, increased LBEDP, postcapillary pulmonary hypertension, which causes right ventricular pressure overload. It causes the RV to dilate, which worsens tricuspid regurg. And what, you, what that causes is seen, is demonstrated here on the left on this MR view. 
So this is a short axis view. You see that the RV is really dilated, is volume and pressure overloaded, and it causes the septum to shift towards the left, compressing the left ventricle, and thereby also limiting the left ventricle to fill, especially during early filling. So we have a unfavorable RV LV interaction, which causes restriction in LV filling and thereby actually worsening pulmonary hypertension. Now, if we treat these patients, and this is an example of, of a patients with TR in severe HEFPEF, you see ventricularization of the right atrial pressure curve, high PA pressures, the, um, the scalar is here one to, to up to 100. So these are PA pressures up to, to 80 invasively, um, massive TR, and then good left ventricular um, function, no MR, but high V wave on, um, on, on wedge pressures indicating um, half PEF. And this is also then confirmed on, on echo with, a, um, with an increased E to E prime. Now, when we treated that patient and reduced tricuspid regurg, we, we found on the post MR actually that the, the interaction between the, the right and left ventricle became much better with um, no sef, um, septal bowing towards the left anymore. The RV became smaller and the LV now fills better and also becomes larger. And this might explain why when you treat TR, you could actually reduce post capillary pressures. And this might explain why those patients are actually doing much better than what those with precapillary pressures. So when you then, when we then look at the time volume curves of the left ventricle, as demonstrated here, you see that here is the end of systole, here begins diastole. You can see that especially during early diastole, the left ventricle feels much better. And in that patient, we also recorded pressure volume loops of the left ventricle. So um, that, that these are um, sort of Frank Starling in, in vivo, um, um, observations recording pressure and, and volume um, throughout the cardiac cycle. We see that afterwards in the left ventricle, there is a rightward shift indicating better filling of the left ventricle, but, and this is um, of importance, with no increase in filling pressures. So better filling of the left ventricle, but even a reduction in filling pressures because we now have, um, we have removed that unfavorable RV-LV interaction. And if we now look then at a greater cohort, we actually see improvement in left ventricular and diastolic volume in these patients. So the RV creates more effective forward flow into the pulmonary artery. So there's more um, pulmonary venous return coming to the left side and um, increased um, um, left ventricular and diastolic volume. Eject refraction state the same, but, and, and this obviously is um, important, we improve cardiac output, left ventricular cardiac output. And, and thereby, um, and this might explain why we see these um, significant and reproducible improvements in NYHA class, in reduction in anti pro BNP, in improvements in six minute walking tests, and also quality of life. Now, all of that, what I've um, demonstrated so far, was um, related to right ventricular, left ventricular function, and the interaction between the two ventricles. But um, we also wanted to look a little bit more on extra cardiac in involvements and, and alterations um, seen due to chronic backward failure and how that might change after um, removing venous congestion. What we quite often observe in these patients, obviously, is um, hepatic congestion, liver fibrosis, more fibrosis, not so often um, cirrhosis, and potentially some um, limitations in liver sim um, synthesis. We quite often see chronic kidney disease, renal congestion, we also see anemia. And there was also a, con um, a suggestion that chronic venous congestion and thereby also intestinal congestion could actually have an impact on nutrition of these patients, because some have increased BMI, but there's also a large proportion of patients with tricuspid regurg, they actually present with um, a very low BMI. And when as assessing the nutrition status in these patients, you can see that there's a high percentage of patients with, who are actually at risk for malnutrition or actually have 
um, 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 already pronounced malnutrition, and that improves after treating TR. So treating TR improves the nutrition status of these patients, and that improvement, again, um, is, is predictive for outcome during follow-up. We also found that treating TR improves renal function with an increase in uh, GFR, a reduction in creatinine and um, in, in creatinine. We found some evidence that liver synthesis might uh, improve after therapy with an increase in, in shonen esterase and either due to better liver function or as a consequence of less bowel congestion we found an increase in albumin and total protein in these patients with improved nutrition status. And that, that's sort of a summary of that. So if, if you think about chronic venous congestion affecting um, the liver, the kidneys, and the bowel causing malnutrition, and if, you, if um, tricuspid uh, transcatheter therapies to, re to reduce TR and thereby improve um, venous congestion, um, these negative effects on malnutrition might be um, reversible, explaining why nutrition status improves in these patients. Cardiohepatic syndrome is something sometimes looked at in surgical series, and we just start to do the same for, for, for these transcatheter therapies. Um, the question was whether that again um, indicates inferior outcome. And this is some work done um, uh, by our um, colleagues in, in, in Munich. And, and they're found in, in the latest um, analysis um, all, over 300 patients, all treated um, on the tricuspid um, valve um, only, so no combined um, cases. They found that the um, predictors for outcome are summarized here. So this is kidney function, MYHA class, the degree of residual TR, um, vena contractor, but also the presence of cardiohepatic syndrome, obviously with those with um, um, overt cardiohepatic syndrome having inferior outcome as compared to those without. But then one last observation I would like to show you, something we, we still have not totally understood, but I think it nicely illustrates that TR is not just a cardiac disease, it is a systemic um, it has systemic um, implications and it is a systemic um, disease and also should be um, um, considered as, as such. Cardiac output is something which is very often used to, um, to, to assess prognosis in, in patients with um, cardiovascular pathologies. When we did so in those patients who underwent transcatheter treatment of TR, we actually found at the first look, we found an inverse correlation, meaning that those with a very high cardiac output, they, those patients had the, the worst outcome, which was, was hard to explain to start with. We then grouped these patients into quartiles, those with very low cardiac output, those with sort of intermediate cardiac output, and those with, very, with um, higher cardiac output. And you can see that low cardiac output, mortality goes up, it is lower in those with intermediate, but it's the highest in those with high cardiac output. And again, here on Kaplan-Meier curves. So hypercirculatory right heart failure in TR appears to, to be associated with, with actually the worst prognosis. We also found that in all of these quartiles, the degree of um, reduced regurgitant volume was the same. However, in this last quartile of patients with hypercirculatory right heart failure, despite the fact that TR was reduced, there was almost no change in right atrial pressures after the procedure. So the same degree of TR reduction, but no change in right atrial pressures in these patients. And the explanation for that um, is, is, is summarized here. So those patients with hypercirculatory, with, this, with that hypercirculatory phenotype, those are patients with um, quite marked and long-standing hepatic congestion. They had um, reduced liver synthesis um, with a marked reduction in cholinesterase, and they had a very high rate of um, um, ascites indicating portal hypertension. And we also found that these patients, they had um, quite marked peripheral vasodilation 
probably explaining the hypercirculatory state in these patients. Now, if we then put that together with um, observations known from primary liver disease, such as um, hepatopulmonary syndrome, and there a the hypercirculatory type had also been described, um, we would speculate that these chronic liver um, alterations, they actually um, lead to sinusoidal fibrosis. They, they cause uh, um, less deposition and increased production of vasoactive substances. And this might also be um, associated with um, chronic intestinal congestion and even microbiome um, shift. We do have some evidence for that, but this is um, a very early work at the moment. So this is my last slide. This is very busy, but this is just uh, our proposed mechanism, how hypercirculatory um, 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 right heart failure might work. Um, some of these things um, were, um, are actually proven. Some of them are highly speculative. It, it, I think it clearly summarizes that TR is not just the cardiac disease, but it involves all, almost every um, organ system um, involved there. But, but what's interesting is that it's not just the hypercirculatory it's not just the 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 the, the, uh, the, the um, peripheral vasodilation, but it's also um, a marked activation of um, of RAS due to um, low pressures in the renal vas afferents, um, which then causes um, uh, sorry increased um, pressure in the vas afferents, um, which then causes um, reduced flow in the vas uh, um, afferents, and thereby we have RAS activation, sympathetic overactivation hypervolemia, hypercirculation, and this is a phenotype which um, um, has not been considered as relevant um, so far, but I think it should be more considered when, when selecting patients for, for treating tricuspid regurgitation. And um, it, it again underlines that um, we have to understand TR as a um, systemic disease especially when it comes to patient selection. And then the last thing I would like to add, um, that despite all the developments in transcatheter therapies for these patients, maybe the biggest, biggest advantage here is that we finally um, have the chance to understand right heart failure a little bit better. This is an example of the European guidelines, but it will be the same for the American guidelines. We have, we have guidelines for everything. We have, a, we have great guidelines to treat um, heart failure, but when it comes to right heart failure, at least in the European guidelines, we do not even have a single chapter on right heart failure. We have no medication, we have no clue, and, and maybe by treating TR and assessing the changes associated, uh, combined um, with that procedure, we can improve our standing of right heart failure a little bit. Um, I hope that was not too complicated. Um, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you. That was a phenomenal lecture, and <clears throat> it's one of those lectures I'm going to have to watch again uh, and listen to it again and look at your slides again because there was just so much information on a topic that, like you summarized, we just understand so little about still. Um, and that was really, you know, you in your talk forced us to think about concepts that even those of us treating TR and involved in this field are not thinking about all the time. So, you know, this is really great. Thank you so much. There are quite a few questions. Um, I have a few, but there's one from Uli Yode. Uh, Uli is uh, the head of heart failure here at Monty and, you know, a true expert in both right side and left side of heart failure and really helping us um, enroll patients and so on. I wouldn't be able to be do it without Uli. Um, so his question, first he says, really outstanding lecture. And then he say, his question is, have PATH with post capillary pulmonary hypertension, how do you decide that diuretic treatment has failed and it's, and it's time to fix the valve? Good question, difficult question. Um, I mean, we normally would not treat a patient who is on, 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 on 10 milligrams of um, trosamide. So we would certainly in, increase that, that dose. Um, but then at the higher end, we, we do not have a, um, a clearly defined um, threshold. We, we try to, to, in, to increase it. Um, we, we 
we have two or three attempts and then um, if they're still symptomatic and if there's no improvement in TR, then we won't consider for treatment. But also because of the observation that these patients seem to do uh, particularly well. Um, so HEFPEF and NTR, I believe, is a, is, is, is a very good substrate for, for, for interventional therapy. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go, I mean, I have a, a couple of questions. I'm gonna, the fellows also are joining. I've allowed them to ask some questions. Um, Starting on the first part, you know, looking at measurement of RV function, and I think we all realize that global RV function uh, is a much better um, factor or variable than just looking at TAPSI. Um, have you been looking at all, I mean, now that, I don't know how many valves you've done as well for tricuspid, but, you know, we've always talked about the fact that there's some patients whose RV function is, um, may look okay, but if you were to do a valve on them, for example, and take away all their TR, there's the risk of causing afterload mismatch and acute RV failure. I mean, any insights or thoughts in your practice? Have you seen this? Uh, are, are you concerned? Do you have any way that you use to, to evaluate these patients and say, I won't do a valve, but I'm actually just going to do uh, edge to edge repair and leave some TR? I mean, it's a difficult one. Um, what, what I can say is, and, and I think you, you can um, confirm that, that in general with these um, repair techniques, acute um, RV failure is, is, is almost never seen. It, it just, it, it does not happen. Um, yeah. And there were major concerns when we started, whether um, the RV will tolerate that um, potential small increase in, in RV loading conditions when we, once we fixed um, TR, but it does not happen. So either it does not happen because we, we always leave a little bit of TR behind, Although having said that there are actually patients where even re with repair, there's almost no TR left. So I'm, I'm not so sure about that. But it, still with, with these valves, we, we will have almost no TR left and the valve might also interact with the subvalvar apparatus and the RV in, in, in general a little bit more. So I think there the risk should be higher than with repair and, um, and it will be important to, to, to look for that. Um, the only way to do that properly would be to differentiate between contraction and contractility. And we do have some insights from pressure volume loop studies indicating that, especially in RV volume overload, the, the uh, ejection fraction or TAPSI might overestimate um, uh, contractility a little bit. Um, so this is exactly what, what you are saying. And um, sometimes it appears that the RV is, is, is still working quite well, but when you then, um, reduce RV volume, but increase um, RV um, um, pressure um, load a little bit, then you could actually end up in a situation where the RV might fail. Um, we just started a study um, with um, um, stress echo mm -hmm. and trying to, to see whether the, the, um, the adaptation to exercise of the right ventricle, whether that helps to, to predict um, right ventricular function after therapy. But at the moment, I think it will be very difficult. And um, for, for replacement technologies, and I think that's done in all trials, patients with um, reduced RV function will, will be excluded and until we know better. Yeah, okay. Um, looking at the, the, the middle part, primary hypertension, um, and the part about discordant pulmonary hypertension makes sense because essentially you die, you're trying to identify those with precapillary hypertension uh, who uh, I understand uh, and makes a lot of sense may not do as well. Um, in the ones who have concordant pulmonary hypertension uh, and so the precapillary component is not dramatic. In Leipzig, now that you have, you can treat patients commercially do you have cutoffs where you say, no, I won't treat above 60 or above 70 if it's concordant and there isn't a big component of precapillary? Not really, no. I mean, these are exactly the two things we look for. We, we want the primary hypertension to be concordant and um, we exclude precapillary. Um, as long as um, these two um, prerequisites are fulfilled, then we would consider treatment. Um, in, 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 in an RV, which is able to generate pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury, I would not be afraid of, of, of the effect of a small increase in afterload 
after fixing TR. So be, because if, if the ventricle can create pressures of 90, um, it, it, it might be even a better sign than than, than end stage um, right ventricle, um, which is not able to um, um, create these high pressures. Right. But um, obviously that's always a bit of a difficult um, decision, but we do not have a, um, a, a clear cut off where we um, would not discuss these patients. All right, all right. Okay, um, a couple of questions from uh, the participants here. So one from Scott Monrad, um, and he was asking about this sort of high output uh, TR that you're talking about. Um, and he says, is it possible that those patients do worse because they have a different process? That is the high output pathology is primary and leads to the TR rather than the other way around. And is, there high, is it their high output pathology if it starts from the beginning that drives their prognosis? Yeah, could be um, very good, very good point. Um, but, but if so, I mean, these patients, they have alterations in their liver structure and function. And if, we, if, if you can't find a primary cause for that, um, then I would argue that it's more um, likely that these um, liver alterations are secondary due to um, 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 chronic venous congestion and TR. Um, but if, if you don't know the time course of these patients, it, it, it might be difficult to differentiate. But if, if, if it was for that reason as um, suggested, then you should be able to find some sort of, of primary hepatic pathology causing it. Um, and if, if, if you can't do so, then I would always argue that um, um, secondary due to cardiac alterations, it is more likely. All right, okay. Um, so there's a question here um, regarding management of combined right and left-sided heart failure, example, severe MR and TR. And this is an area you've done a lot of work in. Um, when do you treat them in the same procedure and when do you uh, treat them as stage procedures? Yeah, so from a reimbursement point of view, it's actually not that easy to, to do these combined procedures anymore. So the, the default strategy always would be to, to do it as a stage. Um, and obviously the advantage of doing as a, a stage is that you, you, you have about one out of four patients, um, you actually see improvement in TR once you fix them up. There's not that many, but um, there, there are some which then might not need um, any TR treatment anymore. We do it as a combined when patients are extremely frail and we do it as a combined, if we see a right to left shunt across the atrial septum, once we pull back the guide um, into the right atrium. Um, because um, in, in our experience, they don't do very well if, if they have a, um, a quite a marked right to left shunt after um, treating um, the mitral regurg in, in severe TR. Okay. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, for the, uh, the last part of your talk about you know TR being a you know a systemic disease, all the negative consequences, hepatic, uh, liver, intestinal from congestion, um, it feels though like that we right, right now we diagnose that too late, in a sense. You know, when we're diagnosing it, it's kind of very apparent, right? Because now patients already have synthetic dysfunction. Or their renal function is worse. I mean, is there? I mean, do you think there are markers that we should be screening for earlier? Because the reason I, I, I say this, one of my biggest issues in enrolling patients in clinical studies is I get set the patient with torrential TR, and I talk to the patient, and he or she says, "Oh no, but I'm completely asymptomatic. Since I'm taking tosamide 20, I don't have swelling, I don't have shortness of breath." And then you look at this severe TR and their right, their right sided pressures that are elevated, and I kind of I feel like sometimes we we don't act early enough, okay? Because we don't have enough tools to say that you know there's certain patients where either we should be doing exercise testing or the other markers we should be using to say this patient needs to be treated earlier um, because we know the natural history uh, of this disease now. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with, um, with what you said, but um, obviously I, um, I have no clue about the answer. Um, I, I think we, we have to aim for the sweet spot in between where um, it, it is not too late to treat these patients, but um, the, the alterations 
and implications of the disease uh, are still significant enough to actually make a difference, especially when, when in, um, rolling these patients into clinical trials, because the next step for the whole field has to, to prove um, benefits in terms of hard clinical endpoints. And there, there are several um, pivotal trials on the way at the moment. And um, it would be very important to, to, to prove um, really clinical benefit in these patients. And um, if you compare to medical therapy only, and if you um, treat them too early, then you will, will not see anything, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So, um, but if you ask me for, for markers, for other markers to look for, it's not just RV function, it's not just pulmonary hypertension, but it's exactly what I said, it is liver function, it is signs of liver congestion. It, um, these are the ones which are at least the easiest to assess. Um, intestinal congestion and changes in microbiome, um, and nutrition status difficult at the moment, I think, at least because we, we, we don't understand it well enough. And then with um, regards to, to renal function, again, it's, it's not easy to always differentiate whether renal impairment is due to high venous pressures or due to, to other, um, other components. But what, what I can say is that when you achieve a good reduction in um, central venous pressures with your therapy, then you almost always see some improvement in renal function. So for renal function, it seems to be much more important to reduce um, venous pressures rather than um, increasing um, cardiac output. Okay, great, excellent, thank you. Um, I see some of the fellows are on. Uh, Shun or Sharon, any questions from you? Yeah, thank you for a very informative lecture and a great discussion, thank you. Um, I have a question about the choice of um, edge to edge repair versus replacement, looking for like future. Um, obviously, in a discussion, um, obviously getting as much TR down is important. And as you said, um, RV tolerates a lot, even if they're failing, you know, acute RV failure is not so common. In the future, you know, if you clip, and I imagine that that would preclude from future replacement in the future, would it be more and more replacement down the line or is there still room to do a clip um, when they're, you know, both in, their patients advanced enough that they are candidate for both? Yeah, I, I guess it will depend a little bit on what we, what we see with the replacement technology in terms of the risk for, for AV block, uh, endocarditis, um, and, and also changes in RV function. Um, if, if that turns out to be a little bit higher than what's been seen with repair, and I would, I would assume that, then the question comes down to how likely it is to reduce TR to, 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 to mild with um, repair as compared to replacement. When you, can do, when you can reduce it to mild with repair, then I probably think that repair will still be a very valid option because what, what we know so far is that we have a very low risk for endocarditis um, during follow-up. We have no risk for, for AV blocks. We have less um, foreign material in the heart, which is always a good thing. If you, if you don't think that you will achieve a good result with repair, then I, I'd guess that a replacement will be the, the best option because that's been shown by, by all trials so far. The more you reduce TR, the better it is for the patient. But I, I think um, even if replacement will, I think it will be as successful as everyone um, is, 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 is hoping um, for at the moment. Um, but repair is, is there to stay. Thank okay. you. Great. Um, Sharon or Theo, any questions from you before we close out? Yeah, hi, um, this is Theo. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, it's, you know, when we're doing interventions, sometimes we forget all these pathophysiologic, you know, mechanisms that lead, you know, to the severe TRs and how we fix you know, and what, what's the, actually the actual impact of our interventions in the patients. So based on that and the data that you saw in the beginning that uh, these interventions looks like they have good benefit actually in the ACC presented the data with the uh, mitral valve, the tricuspid valve replacement. My question to you is that about your guideline, the guidelines, when do you think they will change or they will, you know, uh, upgrade the recommendations for the TR interventions? Because I feel that that's one of the reasons why we have, uh, 
we don't refer they don't refer so many patients for to to us you know for interventions because as per the guidelines it's not like the TR interventions they're not very high you know level of recommendation I, I guess to make a huge difference in terms of guidelines, um, we have to wait until we the, the results of the pivotal trials are out there and then hopefully they're positive. Um, before that, it will be difficult. Although I have to say that um, giving all the, 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 the lack of, of evidence, the, the, the clinical, clinical benefit is really sometimes surprising in these patients. And, and in my experience, the clinical benefit after treating TR is, is, is more likely than, than after treating um, Emma, at least when, when they come back to our clinics. I mean, right heart failure is just something, is a very unfortunate thing to have for patients. And if you reduce right heart failure, they're gonna be happy and they, they, they tell you what, what it meant for them. And as, as soon as, as, as you have um, a couple of those patients and they go back to their GP, then suddenly you, you will get a lot of referrals. So um, I have to say that uh, these days we get more referrals for treating TR than we do for MR. And this is not just at our center. So there's a bit of a shift. And most centers, they have at least 50% um, um, split be be between MR and TR treatment. And I'm pretty sure that the same will happen in the US. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We're seeing the same change happening already. Um, Sharon? No, no, no I'm, actually, I think the most important part in, 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 in natural history of TR is actually the point when you decide to refer the patient for treatment. And I think you, you, you mentioned it uh, already. So uh, I think we should dig into it, uh, you know, more uh, thoroughly and, and, and expand our knowledge in this, in this, uh, in this regard. Uh, I have no further questions. Well, um, really great lecture. I really enjoyed this. Um, it, it's made us all think a lot. And like, you know, Theo said, uh, it makes us take a step back and think about pathophysiology more, particularly of this interesting disease on the right side where we understand so little. And I learned so much from you today. Uh, and so it's always good to see you. I look forward to seeing you in the next couple of days as we do PCR. Take That's care, my friend. Thank you. For I thank you very, very much for the invite. It, it was fun and it was a really great pleasure to be part of it.